Welcome back, everyone. Sir 86, 5 through 7 says, So let the human consider, what was he created from? He was created from spurting water. It comes forth from a place between the spine and the ribs. I'll talk about Muslim apologetic gymnastics later on in this video. For now, let's simply acknowledge the fact that the Quran says, Reproductive fluid comes from between the spine and the ribs. As many have noted, there is precedence for very similar ideas in ancient medical literature that's associated with names like Hippocrates, Aristotle, and Galen. Galen states, The seed is secreted, as Plato and Diocles say, from the brain and the spinal marrow. But Praxagoras, Democritus, and Hippocrates too say that it is secreted from the whole of the body. Samuel Kotek summarizes the Hippocratic perspective which you just heard alluded to, which argued that seed originates from the whole body and arises in the spinal cord like a foam and flows through the kidneys. I'll let you hear that again from a different perspective because this is all very strange. This fluid is diffused from the brain into the loins and the whole body, but in particular into the spinal marrow, for passages extend into this from the whole body, which enable the fluid to pass to and from the spinal marrow. At this point, parallels to Surah 86 are striking. So just keep that in mind for later. In these ancient medical texts, we also see a debate over the part that each parent plays in forming the embryo. What role does the father's reproductive fluid play? What about the mother? Does she even have reproductive fluid? Aristotle's view was that the woman does not produce semen. Rather, the male's seminal fluid shapes the blood of the mother to produce the embryo. Thus, while the mother does not produce semen, she still plays a major role in the formation of the embryo. Given the Quran contains a conspicuous parallel to ancient medical theories, it's interesting to ask if there's anything that gives us a hint about its perspective on the role men and women play in reproduction. I believe it does. Aristotle's opinion about the woman's significant contribution to the embryo was in contrast to some other popular theories that women do not contribute to the embryo. To get an idea of how widespread these theories were, let's start with a Hindu source. Men who have no marital property in women, but sow their seed in the soil of others, benefit the owner of the woman. In an ancient Greek play, Apollo states, The mother of what is called her child is no parent of it, but nurse only of the young life that is sown in her. The parent is the male and she but a stranger, a friend who, if fate spares his plant, preserves it till it puts forth. The first century BC Greek historian Diodorus Siculus states, The Egyptians hold the father alone to be the author of generation, and the mother only to provide a place to grow and nourishment for the fetus. In his book on the natural faculties, Galen states, The seed, having been cast into the womb or into the earth, for there is no difference. Let's move into some Jewish texts. From the 2nd century BC comes the wisdom of Ben Sirah. Some manuscripts include this passage. My child, keep sound the bloom of your youth, and do not give your strength to strangers. Seek a fertile field within the whole plain, and sow it with your own seed. As the remaining context makes clear, a fertile field and sowing seed are referring to human reproduction, where the female is the field, and into the Talmud where we see numerous references likening virgin women to virgin fields. The text translated from Aramaic is italicized, and the Hebrew is in plain type. There are three kinds of virgin, the virgin girl, the virgin soil, and the virgin sycamore. The virgin girl is one that has never had sexual relations. The virgin soil is soil that has never been cultivated. As we've seen, the comparison of a woman to a field for sowing seed in the context of reproduction is widespread. Given this and the substantial influence rabbinic tradition had on the Quran, you know where we're going next. The Quran states, Your women are like a field for you, so come to your field when you wish. In this verse, the Quran is disagreeing with the Hippocratic theory of two seeds, that the man and woman both contribute reproductive fluid to the embryo. It also seems clear that the Quran is disagreeing with Aristotle. As we've seen, while he did not believe in the two seeds theory, he did believe 
that the woman contributed substantially to the embryo. But in Surah 2, 2.23, the woman is simply a field for sowing seed. In this sense, the Quran is non-Aristotelian and non-Hippocratic. But the Hadith are different. They appear to embrace Aristotelian and, to some extent, Hippocratic embryology. Muhammad said that the child will resemble whatever parent discharges first during intercourse. Note that this so-called knowledge was revealed by the angel Gabriel to Muhammad, even though such speculation had been occurring many centuries before Islam, and we know from modern science that this is false. These hadith also strongly resemble Aristotle, so that if this movement, that is the semen, gains the mastery, it will make a male and not a female, and a male which takes after its father, not after its mother. Notice the difference between Hippocrates and Aristotle. One of the oddities of Aristotle's theory of inheritance, then, is that he thinks that most features, he is certainly thinking of facial features here, are sex-associated. Boys generally take after their fathers, girls after their mothers, just like what we read in the Hadith. Hippocrates assumes a continuous distribution, depending on the precise proportions of parental seed. So these Hadith, referring to the woman's discharge, appear to affirm the Hippocratic theory of two seeds against Aristotle. Again, the Hippocratic school believed that there was male and female seed, whereas Aristotle believed that only the male contributed seed, while the female contributed blood, which together formed the embryo. But they also appear to affirm Aristotle over Hippocrates when it comes to determining the traits of the child. To summarize, in ancient medical theory, we have competing explanations for how embryos are formed. The Hadith we read appear to affirm the Hippocratic theory of two seeds, that is, both the male and female contribute seed. But the same Hadith also affirm Aristotelian embryology as well, where the features of a child are sex-associated. If the man discharges first, the child is a male and will resemble a father, according to Muhammad. There's really no hint of the Hippocratic school here, which taught that a child's features could be a blend of the parents, depending on the proportion of parental seed. We therefore seem to have a confused and confusing mixture of ancient medical theory. In the Quran, we've seen close parallels to ancient theories that reproductive fluid comes from the spine. Whether it arises or combines there or passes through, the spine and kidney areas are involved. We also saw that the Quran appears to reject Aristotelian and Hippocratic embryology. In the Quran, women are just a field for planting. In line with some widespread medical theory, the Quran asserts that women simply provide biological space for the embryo to grow. The subsequent phrase, so come to your field when you wish, cannot reasonably be interpreted as a positive portrayal of a woman's role in procreation. On the contrary, in Surahs 2 and 86, the Quran echoes two elements of ancient medical theory. The first entails a demeaning view of women and a demonstrable understatement of the female role in procreation, and the second regards the location of reproductive fluid. When we compare the Quran and the Hadith, we see a different cognitive environment. Clearly, the author of the Hadith has had more exposure to other medical theories. The descriptions in the Hadith are more detailed, positing more knowledge about the matter than the Quran. But the Hadith also endorsed conflicting medical theories with that of the Quran, for in several Hadith, the women are no longer a mere plot of land for incubating the embryo. They are not a passive field for planting. Rather, they play an active role in determining the traits of the child based on which parent discharges first. Thus, the medical theories espoused by the Hadith contradict the Quran and appear much later. Note that my assertion that the Hadith authors had more exposure to ancient medicine is not historically far-fetched, given the evidence for the dates of composition and transmission of the Hadith. Peter Porman's research led him to the conclusion that by the late 9th century, the vast majority of Greek medical texts available in late antique Alexandria had been rendered into Arabic. But there's one possible link between ancient medicine, the Quran, and Hadith that seems frequently overlooked. Decades ago, Joseph Needham noted that such an idea that women play the part of farmland would have been a natural concomitant of the practice, also widespread in antiquity, of putting captured males to death and retaining the females as concubines. 
the conquerors would thus have no fear of corrupting the race with alien blood. The whole matter affords an excellent illustration of the way in which an apparently academic theory may have the most intimate connections with social and political behavior. One wonders if the women as farmland mentality was not lurking in the background of numerous hadith where Muhammad expresses nothing but endorsement for having sex with female captives. Muhammad's band of merry men even asked him about coitus interruptus, that is, when the man withdraws before orgasm to avoid pregnancy. Muhammad replied, You can't just have sex with these captive women. I'm taking a stand for women's rights. Not really. Let me try that again. Muhammad replied it was better for the warriors not to practice coitus interruptus with the captive women. The theory that these hadith do reflect the women as farmland idea is plausible because, of course, the basis for these hadith is the Quran, which, as we've seen several times now, endorses that very idea. Thus, these verses that approve of men having sex with captive women fit neatly into the idea that women are simply a field to plow. On some points, we've seen that the Quran and Hadith disagree. But when it comes to allowing soldiers to have their way with captive women, they agree just fine. No surprise there. Okay, scientific miracles in the Quran and Hadith, Muhammad's miraculous knowledge of embryology, we've all heard it before. Let's talk about how it started. Muhammad Ghali comments, In the 20th century, references to human embryology in the Quran and Sunnah have been a source of great inspiration for Muslim authors who contributed to biomedicine cum theology, that is, Islamic scholarship aided by modern biological insight. At the beginning of this century, the Muslim world was suffering from setbacks on the cultural, intellectual, scientific, and military levels. Most of the Muslim world had been colonized by European countries, and Muslim populations had a strong feeling of religious identity crisis. The scientific and technological advances of the victorious European nations on the one hand and the backwardness of life in the Muslim world on the other hand raised questions about Islam and its incompatibility with modern science. In this context, Muslim authors invoked references to human embryology in the Quran and Sunnah, not only to confirm the oneness of God as earlier works did, but also to prove the truthfulness of Islam and the Quran, its divine origin, and its compatibility with modern biomedical sciences. Such scientific claims began not on the basis of any new data in Quran or Hadith studies. These claims arose out of an identity crisis. And this movement gained momentum. Ghali continues, describing how the use of scriptural references to human embryology in support of the scientific accuracy of Islam in the Quran increased greatly in the 1980s. There was actually a commission formed in 1983 just to publish material affirming these so-called scientific miracles. Examples of how these movements fail are perhaps no better illustrated than by Hamza sources who published his work on scientific miracles in the Islamic sources. Later, his thesis was followed up with this blog post. This is a long read, so I'll summarize. The scientific miracles narrative is an embarrassment to the Muslim world. Hamza got in trouble when he was confronted about some scientific claims he was making. Like a good Muslim apologist, when proven wrong, he doubled down on his claims, just like he was trained. But he made some mistakes. He trusted other Muslim apologists as his sources, they in turn also used other Muslim apologists. Publishing for the Muslim world, this isn't an issue. It's only a problem if people are actually going to critique it, and some did. As a result, Hamza's work was withdrawn. He calls this process a learning curve and an exercise in integrity, whatever all that means. The only learning curve I can think of is that he learned that you don't get to do garbage work, have that work rightly destroyed by critics, and then act like you learned some objective lesson when all you learned is that you can't get away with doing garbage work. Interestingly, this issue with Hamza showed up in a 2016 PhD dissertation on Islamic Dawah in the UK. It discusses Hamza's failure on the scientific miracle claims as well as his plagiarism. That link is in the free resource, which includes a transcript of this video. Get that in the description box or the pinned comment before we summarize a bit of irony. Recall what Muhammad Ghali said, at the beginning of this century, the Muslim world was suffering from setbacks on the cultural, intellectual, scientific, and military levels. 
As our friend Hamza notes, one response was to attempt a scientifically miraculous reading of the Muslim sources, which turned out to be an embarrassment, or in Muhammad Ghali's words, a setback. Therefore, attempts to fix the intellectual and scientific setbacks in the Muslim world resulted in more intellectual and scientific setbacks in the Muslim world, courtesy of people like Hamza sources. And the intellectual setback, which resulted from the other intellectual setback, continues today, since many of these arguments are still reverberating off of the walls of the Muslim world. In fact, I'll make a prediction. We will see some of these very same arguments in the comments under this video posted by Muslims who have been lied to by their leaders and shielded from the truth. But any Muslim who reflects on the legacy of their leaders in the last few decades on this issue alone will see more than enough reason to never trust them again. And that is the first step to freedom. Now let's summarize. The Quran echoes ancient medical theory in that it attempts to describe the location of reproductive fluid and regards women as a field for planting. Some hadith echo Aristotelian and Hippocratic embryology against the Quran. Some hadith appear to endorse views of both Hippocratic and Aristotelian embryology, which conflict. Muhammad and ancient Greek medicine got a lot wrong about embryology. However, in Muhammad's case, he is said to have received his knowledge from the angel Gabriel, who apparently is not well versed in genetics. We have indication that the Hadith authors had more exposure to Greek medical theory than the Quran's authors, indicating a later date of composition for the respective Hadith. We also briefly traced the development of some scientific miracle claims. They're all garbage. Some of what you heard is well known. Some of it hopefully was new. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Just think of the comments as your own personal field and you can plow it however you want. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.